walking it, walking it, walking it, walking it every day. And welcome back. Walking with us, my friends. All is one. Um, you got some coffee there, huh? I got coffee what, ice cubes. What kind cubes. of coffee did you... Oh, coffee. So I, I, I got a misadashi. What is that? So what, what they do is they take a huge amount of grinds, like real nice, real nice beans. They're going to lay like a cheesecloth on the bottom, like a like two pounds of the grinds inside this this dish, cheesecloth, and then they slow drip ice water for 14 hours on top of it. Mm. So create, and then it goes through this helix. I saw the too. machine there. Yeah. yeah. And it creates a concentrate at the bottom. Yeah. That's super cool. Delicious. I love that. So I want to get into something today. What? That synchronic? I think, no, synchronic. Yeah. We're going to get into <laughs> I want to um, take that fusion and tra- travel yeah. through time. <laughs> Let's travel through time. <laughs> um, I want to get into uh, we, cause we've talked about this before, but I think this is uh, relevant with a lot of people that are dealing with, it's a process when you're coming from, and I'm going to use the word detoxing. Let's use that word. When you're detoxing from religion over to something. But I think there's, uh, here's the problem. I, I was watching something the other day and they were in um, Germany, something like that. And they were asking these young kids about religion, you know, and they're like, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. Okay. And I was like, are you? <laughs> are you using that as excuse not to have responsibility because i'm not I'm, not I'm not saying religion is bad or good but i'm saying there's a certain requirement of uh, taking responsibility you know carl Jung, we talked about this goes between like the dichotomy of state and church. Uh, state and church you know but there is a thing there is a thing you have to get up in the morning sunday morning and go to church mm-hmm. like you have to take personal responsibility and get up early but if i say i'm just spiritual then i get to sleep in because i stayed up too late on Saturday night and I partied and uh, I drank. Are, are you are you getting to the point where it's like if I say I'm spiritual, I don't have to practice dogmas? Yeah, or are are really, well, then what I'm saying is like they I really don't, don't practice anything. That's what I'm saying. Like it's like I can still believe in a god, but I'm not mm. going to practice anything. Mm. Yes. Is that what you're calling spiritual? So now it's a total lack of responsibility or action altogether. It's this idea of non-action that well, it's it's like I, I I was listening to a lady and she was talking about the rosary beads, you know, and it helps her because it's she's a very physical person. So just like crystals or or, or you know, I do the candle meditation that yep. you showed me. You know, the, the, I'm that type of way too. I, I like touching something physical helps me. You know what I mean? Or or having an item like this pyramid or whatever, it it, it brings it brings it to um, it, it's something tangible that I can have as a tool to help me. Focus. Through that bridge. Yeah. Yeah, to help you focus. So whether it's rosary beads or whatever it may be, but it's like the lady that's doing the rosary bead meditation or prayer or whatever you want to call it, she's more spiritual than the person that's turning around and saying, you know, she's taking time out of her day to do something. Yeah, she may have, there may be religious dogma and all that in there and fear and, and all, but at, at, at least she's having a practice. Do you see what I'm saying? I do. And I think that's where religion... Even though, yeah, it might, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even though she might be, you know, going in a weird direction. Right. She's taking a direction. And in that direction is learning. It's not going, it's not taking a path of no learning. Mm. Or it's like, I'm spiritual. So I just, you know, I I float around. That's not what that is. She's requiring a practice. She's creating focus. She has an intention towards an end goal. What's your end goal? Where do you want to evolve to? In being spiritual, what's the end game with that? Or are you just saying, oh, I'm spiritual? It's an, to me, it's an excuse. You know what it reminds me of? Um, I'm independent. I I dress like this because it shows it's just, it defines who I am. Right. So what? You still have to like. I mean, you're a human being and you're different. You don't have to like put the clothing on to tell mm-hmm. me that you're a different human being. Because because when you say you're spiritual, can you articulate that? Yeah. Can Can you logically and rationally make? a point to me why religion, why you feel religion, religious dogma is so bad and why your homebrewed beliefs yeah. <laughs> that you've made your kombucha beliefs <laughs> that you made Scooby. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that you, that you've created because good luck on that. Yeah. Really in reality, good luck on you coming up with your own <laughs> values and morals. Good luck on the homebrew. <laughs> People have tried that before. It does not work. It hasn't worked. We need some form of stability. Yeah. And you know where you can find stability? Just look at nature. Well, yeah, exactly. 100%. People come up with these like weird 
crackpot ideas of what they define spiritual uh, spirituality as. Or like, I need to wear something to be spiritual. Mm. I have to do this to be spiritual. No, spirituality is an awareness. It's a focus. The woman with the rosary beads or you with this thing that is physical is giving you focus. Yes. But this this idea that we're finding, how people are saying I'm being spiritual, lacks total focus. It's like using it as like a cop-out excuse. Like, yeah, I believe in God, but I don't want to have to go to church. I don't have to spend my time doing this. I just settle in and then take this theme and then run with this just open theme of doing whatever I need to do. Mm. Well, and, and I, I believe that, and I'm going to use that word in this way. I was about to, I, I had my head <laughs> cocked. Cause I'm, I'm going to talk about, I, I want to talk about belief in this way. And I, I want to talk about it in a relationship. So if you and I are walking and we're having a talk and, and let's we say do, we're we walking, we just, just do, I know that's we why this is where it just came to head. And we're talking and, conversation is going and then finally you you pause to me and you say jason i need to tell you something really important you're fine. and then i pause and I, I yeah you're fine yeah you even <laughs> made a joke about that and uh uh no and i look at you and you're like well he go i'm kind of embarrassed to say this but and you tell me something deeply personal to you sure i have a choice right then after you tell me that which is i have to believe or trust that what you're telling me because it could be a lie mm -hmm. but i doubt it is because of the sincerity and the relationship that I have with you. But I really 100% can't factually say what you're telling me is right. No, you're not because it's not your experience. Right. It's mine. Right. And so, he, so do you see where I'm going with that? This lie could also be my experience. So it's truthful in the fact that it's an experience, but what's being said could be a lie or it could be the truth. The data could be legit or not. And, and that's where I wanted to get into the Bible and these spiritual texts because... That's what, for these writers that, because we, we have to admit, I mean, logically, the Bible every year is the number one selling book. All the time. Um, of all time. Our art, our culture, our government, especially here in the United States. Um, and you can go to South America. Yep. I mean, if you look at uh, Italy. Go to Brazil. Yeah. Bra yeah. Has been changed by Christianity. Mm -hmm. Catholicism, Christianity, whatever you want to call it. All the same. So that foundation of Christianity and people having that belief of that, when we look at the Bible in the way that people look at it in trying to interpret it as a historical document, trying to interpret it as being factual, literal, real God's spoken word, they're not understanding the relationship that that person had when they wrote that scripture as you having that relationship, what you just said, us having that relationship and you turning around and telling me something very intimate that could be, but I'm not going to perceive you. I'm not going to look immediately look at you and say, it, I'm not going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be empathetic to you. Thank you. And I'm going to be listening. I'm going to like really listen. Thank you. And then I'm going to be like, how can I help? You know, like, I mean, mm -hmm. that would be the natural or, or is there anything I can do, you know, or just do you need me to listen, you know? But when whenever you look at the way that we look at these sacred texts, like the Bible, it our response is so far removed from what those texts are there for. Mm. They're there for that interpretation of us to look at it. Like I said. You need something physical. It spends, Genesis spends, what, a half a chapter on talking about creation? Yeah. That's not the end all be all for how the world was. Science has proven that. We're on to the next Could, thing. Do you know how many papers have been written and someone does not half a chapter? The whole Bible would be about creation if it wanted to prove a scientific point. Yeah. The writer, which they think Moses was, the writer in Genesis, <clears throat> was saying, hey, here's here's how the earth, you know, and, and it's metaphor. You could take it. The whole damn thing's metaphor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you don't have a relationship with the people that wrote it. No, you that's just, where I'm getting at. You have to, you're reading a book with no personal relationship to the author that sits outside of this mm -hmm. metaphor you had given before about you and I, this hypothetical scenario. So when you go to receive that information, how do you want to look at that experience? How do you want to apply focus to that experience? Do you look at it as, okay, someone is sharing an experience on paper through story. And when I take that in, do I take it in as truth or do I take it in just as an experience of learning? 
mm, regardless yes, of whether it's so truthful true. or, yeah. or false. I love you said experience of learning. Because that's what it is. Yes. And you, it, that, that makes it individual. I could pick the Bible up. It could be the most negative thing in the world. Right. But the question is the experience of interacting with it. What was the, Was there a learning that was happening? Rather than me just focusing on, oh, how much is true? How much is false? You know, how much is negative? How much is it's positive? It's not designed for that. Yeah, it's, it's not. That's not what it's for. So even if it was extremely negative or extremely positive, what is the learning that happens through the interaction with it? Mm-hmm. Not trying to define it into some sort of percentage. Do you, yeah, see, do you, yeah, see, yeah. you see what I mean? No, I'm, I'm seeing exactly what you're saying. So that way, you when you interact with these things, when you begin to study other religions, you don't know the authors. You don't know for a fact mm, what they were right. trying to say. And that's yes. why all these people have these interpretations mm-hmm. for whatever it might but be. The, but the interpretations are good because that causes critical thinking and allows you no, it does. to see, you know, like Jonah in the well, for instance, that's, that's an allegory. But, but, but I mean, whenever you see that story, it's going to hit people differently ways when you read that story. That's because it's not about the truth of the story. It's not yes, about the data. Yes. If you look at it, essentially in the, the fish idea, could be a representation psychologically of all if, kinds of things. If it's just one mythical metaphor, okay, it's the experience you have being with the metaphor. Mm-hmm. Can something great be learned from it, regardless how, how negative or positive or orientation it might be? Yes. And that's what the focus should be. It's not for you to stand here and listen to me. And if I have to share a problem with you for you to determine whether it's true or false mm. or whether or not I'm saying something, you know, just, you know, for attention or whatever it might be. It's the fact that it's an experience that's being had. So what is there to be learned from the experience, regardless of what's being said, what's being said really doesn't matter. It's the interaction of the experience between you and me or me in a religious text or me and a person giving a sermon. Yeah. Same thing. Yep. Nobody people, none of these people know for a fact any about the stuff about the information. It could the whole thing could be a lie, but it's what is it about the experience that caused the learning? And, and when you look at it, like let's take the Old Testament for instance, because we're talking about the Bible, and we'll get into other texts here in a second. But when we when we look at the Bible, we look at the Old Testament. There's something unique about it in the sense of the way it follows Joseph Campbell's when you talk about the hero's journey. But yep. but it, it's most ancient texts make the their heroes, the kings like in Egypt, they make them like gods Yeah, without mistake. The Bible is brutal. Like the number one person, King David, you know, David, he's like the number one person in the old Testament. You know I mean? People would argue with that, but that's pretty much, it's supposed to be after God's own heart and all that stuff. And the whole new Testament talks about. So King David in the scriptures, it has a lot in the old Testament about him, but it also shows that he lied. He cheated. Mm -hmm. He murdered. He committed adultery. He killed the woman's uh, the the um, the woman that he committed adultery with. Don't talk about Donald Trump like that. <laughs> kind of same thing, yeah. Um, he killed the, her husband so that he could have her, you know. And then they created Solomon, which was. But I, I'm I, what I'm saying is okay. Now you now you recognize there's something unique right here. Yeah. Okay. Here's a text that's being brutally honest about the hero's journey. Sure. I can learn from that. Right. So, so that gives me hope because it's like, okay, this guy accomplished a lot, but he was still fucked up. Whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Yeah, it doesn't matter. A yeah. learning can happen. Yes, right there. I could read Nancy Drew, The Hardy Boys, The Bible, or a nonfiction text on quantum mechanics. Or I can look at that and say, okay, first and second chronicles in the Bible, that's the chronicles of the kings from 426 BC to 428. It was yeah. this king. Well, let me go look and see and make sure archaeological digs line up with line this. Up with what was going on. It's like, you got no learning from that. Who cares? It doesn't, it's, it's not about that. That. Didn't, that didn't do anything. Trying to prove the validity of something is a waste of time. Let it just be true or false, but you know, fuck it. How do you experience the false? How do you experience the truth? How do you experience something that challenges your perspective? Or how do you experience, how do you learn from people that are trying to experience God? Right. You, you look at them and you ask them about their experience. Don't ask about the data. Don't nitpick. Learn from them. What is it about being a part of a religion that makes you feel good? Where do you find your focus? Mm. What do you want to evolve to? What do you think actually helps with that? Then you can start to assimilate data on experience. Not about data about saying, oh, does this have a historical record that lines up? Now I'll listen to these people. But it, it, but this new generation that's coming out, my generation and, and, and younger, um, we, we look at Carl Jung, you know, and obviously he believed in some type of God. Guy slaps. Yeah. But dismissing him because he has this form of Christianity that he believes in, you're missing the point. Mm-hmm. You, do you see what I'm saying? 
no, no matter whether it's the Bible or he's, you know, Islamic or, you know, he's, he's Jewish or it doesn't matter. We, we have to start looking at people as having personal experiences spiritually in the way that they evolve. That's correct. And, and, it, it, and th- there may be a false label. Maybe it's Jesus. Maybe it's Muhammad. Maybe whatever. But that person is progressing spiritually. And if they're sinu- genuine and sincere, I tried to commit those words together. Just I, yeah, <laughs> if they're genuine and sincere, that's their evolution for, reli- for their journey. Jazeera. Yeah, Jazeera. Yeah. <laughs> is that a city? <laughs> Al Jazeera, yeah, Al Jazeera. Yeah. No, that's a network, right? <laughs> it's a new network. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. No, but you're you're correct. And some people take religion and they throw it onto a hierarchy. And again, it's like, does this match up with the historical record? Do, can I put it in a box? Do I really sit above these people? Now I can tell them what they need to look at. It's like, no, just let people experience what they need to experience. Don't force something on them that you think is fact. Yeah, because like right now, you see all this QAnon stuff going on you know, cue this, cue that. And you you see that. And you, you, these people have literally taking all these conspiracy theories that has no fact or logic in it. And they're believing a story or a narrative. Okay. That's extremely negative. Mm -hmm. Um, Anti-Semitic. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things with Mm -hmm. that, but they're allowing themselves to get so emotionally attached to it that it's creating their identity. They're identifying. Because they're literally believing it and not because whether it's the Bible, whether it's Q, whether it's, you know, an Islamic test, it doesn't matter. You always need to keep self. Yes. Self, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Don't start mixing in mm. really who you are and attach it with the story itself. Whatever that narrative might be. Because, you know, I was reading uh, on Reddit, because on Reddit there's a law of one. And so people talk on it all the time. And then you get the people in there and they're like, well, there was a 2012 prediction and da, da, da. Yeah. I'm pretty sure if I dig hard enough in the law of one books that I have up here, yeah. I'm pretty sure I'll find some errors. It's a, pre- it's, it, it's a prediction. <laughs> it's not an absolute. You know what I mean? Like chill out. <laughs> but I mean, it's like I, whether I, wh- whatever book I'm going to read yeah, or teachings I'm going to read, there's going to be, it's not a hundred percent perfect. No, it's, it's not, not made for that. Is nature a hundred percent perfect? No. It has to have balance. Yeah, they're always striking balance. One side will be more than the other, and then it will find equilibrium. The books you're reading now, the person that interprets it from German to English is going to have some issues. Correct. This is why they prefer that it, you don't read it translated. Exactly. You know? but And that's... The, so, okay, so I will I will take a shout to this. The The contextual difference from for the Bible uh, to things like the Love One or like the Billy Edward Albert Meyer material, the player on spirit teachings is that here's a narrative. Here are facts. Here are experiences, which you can test against these facts and the narrative. Shit. They gave us, they, when most times we look at a religious text, thank you for the mythological story. We don't know whether it's true or false. Okay. Just because of its age and all those other things. So accept the experience just for what it is, learn from the experience. Now it's like, here's the data. Here's the experience. You know, there's a, this, it's like a full package. But it's still, it's still the same to me because it may, maybe we disagree on this. Maybe you can help me understand. But when I read the law of one and I see how they made the pyramids and they explain that, I still have to take that at faith. Oh, no, oh, no, no. That, you see yeah, what I'm saying? Because I, I don't know that that to be factually true. You're, you're I, it makes sense correct. to me, logically. That, that, that is correct. The law one is a little bit more difficult. Yeah. But the Billy Edward Albert Meyer material, if in I'm and not, I haven't read very much of that, and so. you haven't read very much of it, but it's Only like when it's online. Here's your historical record. Mm-hmm. Here are the people. Here's your evidence. Here is your narrative, and here are the learnings. It gives you the full gambit. Mm. So it's not like you, you you don't look at it as a myth. They give it to you so you can test it as reality, which is a lot different than looking at a religious text. That's the difference. They but put he, it all, even, they, they tee it all up. Even whether it's the, the, the collective with raw or whether it's the Pleiadians, even they're not perfect. No, none of them are perfect. If they were perfect, you would be the universe Because itself. here's the problem. Here's the problem that people get into. They want something perfect to grab onto. Uh-huh. They feel like they have to, it's fundamentalism. They feel like they have to, you know, it's like the, uh, we'll use the Bible or we could use the law of one text. You know, it's like, I'm law of one. I'm all in. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. I, 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 I'm a Christian saved by grace. But I <laughs> made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. I'm that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or you know, um, I studied Anton uh, Levey, and I'm a Satanist. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I'm gonna wear black and put a pentagram on my forehead. But uh, but I'm only reading one book. Why, why does that have to like? Because people say that all the time. They're like, man, when I read this, my eyes were opened. And I yeah. knew I found the truth. No, I no. Listen, do you know how much truth is out there? It's, it's not just in one book. <laughs> it's true to you for today, but it wasn't yesterday. So what Ooh. is it going to be like tomorrow? Yes. So the best part, you know, and this goes back to critical thinking and self awareness. Right. Although these materials that we talk about, in comparison to the other things, are phenomenal, everything does have a weakness. Nothing has its perfection. So it may hold true for a great body of time until something more refined comes out mm, yes. and then you need to refine your perspective with it and go back and test and retest. Mm. If you just read something once and say, that's it. You don't think I retest this material. You don't think I read something here and then go check it in 30 other different areas. You have to. Yeah. And I, I think with postmodernism, cause you can really see this. Um, and, and religion responded to this, especially like, especially Christianity, like American church, let's say that, or, or it could be over. And um, they tried to, I mean, when you were a kid, you know, you could go to, you could go to a Christian church and they would have Sunday school and they would have balloons and color crayons and give you Kool-Aid and, and cookies and get you all sugared up and you're praising Jesus, you know. And then they had summer camps and they had all this stuff. So they were trying to fight postmodernism with this shallow evangelical, like evangelist um, message that cheapened the reality of what a relationship really is. So now it became a form, and that's what we're seeing now with Christianity. Now it became a form of entertainment that I go to a place, like much like a movie theater. I go to a place and I get entertained and have this experience much as I'm moved if I watch an Avengers movie, just as much as I'm moved. Down here, a um, couple blocks away, like a Sagebrush Church. Yeah. On Easter, they had a huge rock concert. Mm -hmm. The fuck does that have to do with God? Anybody? I, but don't you feel like this is if, if you were it, it, that's the if you were in now, charge though, if you were in charge of of Christianity, I would go back to the form of and I'm playing devil's advocate, but I would go back to the form of no saying, pun intended saying, let's go back to the early fathers, let's go back to where the Christian mystics were at, where there's a hero's journey that you have to take, mm. and it's hard. Most people died and sacrificed their life for this. Right. So it's really fucking tough. It's tough to take 100% self-responsibility. It's tough to look at yourself and look at your heart and know that you're fucked up. And treat people respectfully. <laughs> and treat others yeah. respectfully. It's I mean, a hard, Jesus' it's teachings not, were... It's literally not Jesus easy. Jesus said that. He goes... Major, well, I mean, he was crucified for it. Yeah, but, but people are always looking for the easy. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. They always want the easy. Well, you look at postmodernism. I want to make sure the definition but is But dude, right evolution... Because this started happening, what, in 1940s, 50s? Dude, evolution... It's not supposed to be easy. It's no. supposed to be a challenge. If it was simple. Look at nature. How challenging is it? How challenging is it for it's a bug to survive? It's not fair either. No, nothing about it. It's not supposed to be. It's not about Six fairness. lions on one baby antelope. That's not fair. No, that the balance is <laughs> off. The balance is off. But that's, why that, there's, but that's why there's more antelope than lions. Yeah, of course. Nature naturally yeah. has these balances yeah. in yeah. there. Postmodernism. Broad movement that developed in the mid to late 20th century across philosophy, the arts, architecture, and criticism, marking a departure from modernism. The term has been more generally described. The historical era said to follow modernity and its tendencies in this era. That actually doesn't say anything for a definition. It doesn't have anything for a definition. I know what modernism is, but postmodernism, go ahead. Does it, does it give like a more tangible mm, definition? Mm, because we're in, the, we're in the budding stages of this. Where I'm talking about, okay. this is, go ahead. Okay, so postmodernism, the late 20th, blah, 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 whatever, that questions the basic assumptions of Western philosophy in a modern period. So you're just questioning how we were doing things before. Oh, that wasn't working, so now we got to do rock concerts. And we talked about the, the Enlightenment. Yes. Uh, the French. Yeah, we got the French Enlightenment and everything else that was happening around that same time. But, but the questions thing. are good, but it's but it's still, there's still a point. And, and I'm going to use a spiritual word here, and you may not like this word, but I'm going to use it. When I Whenever I go to an art museum and they have something that moves me. I love art museum. I, I have a, a, here's my spiritual word. And I, I like this word a lot. I have a reverence for it because of the connection that I make with it. And to me, that is a connection. That is a connection that's between me and that piece of art. 
And now, why do you have the reverence? Because it's uh, reverence right here is respect or honor for what is felt or shown. So what are you respecting or honoring when you're having that sort of I experience? I think I'm respecting the relationship that I have with the art because other people may walk by the art and not and just be like, eh. And then I, and you've had, con- you've told me conversations where you've been really moved by art. Oh, yeah. And, and, but that was an experience for you individually with that piece of art and you. That's what I mean. And no yeah. one else can explain it. No one can. You experience that. Correct. And that's the whole, that's how we go back to the whole thing. <laughs> yes. If we go back to our original thing that we were striking, you, you and I having a conversation on the side of the street and I said, I got to tell you something. Mm-hmm. It's not about the data. It's about the experience mm-hmm. and what was learned from the experience. If you're going to read the Bible, if you're going to be a part of 15 religions over the course of your life, look at the experience. Don't look at this religion and then test its data against another one. It's all going to be junk regardless. Read them all. Read them all. Yeah, yeah. You should be a student of your spirituality. Yeah, you're, if you're a student of your own spirituality. <laughs> you're not just, religious, but spiritual. <laughs> yeah, so they go back and be like, what it, was it about the experience of being there with that group, interacting with that material? What was learned there? Because you will evolve. Because that will evolve. Because say I go across 15, they all, they all suck. They're all false. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? You found out that there's 15 things that don't work for you. So where does that leave you? With only the things left that could possibly work for you. If I read the Bible, the Quran, and the Book of Raw, Plurian and Teachings, all those. So let's say I read five books, five spiritual books. I guarantee I'm going to evolve reading all five of them. 100%. And I guarantee I'm going to evolve in different ways in the way that I've learned through each of them. Correct. So stop making things bad. It's a human concept, bad. <laughs> it's a totally human concept, bad. That's bad. Hitler, bad. Yeah. Stalin, bad. This book, bad. You can learn from that. The fa- those were both failed states. So what can we not do as humans so that we don't experience fascism or communism? Or what if you, what if you have some... Or any other ism. You're like, wow, that was a bad experience. Yeah, it was. Are you going to do it again? No. Great, you learned something. Mm-hmm. Phenomenal. Yes. That's all that matters. And if a group of people can learn something together, even wow. better. Yeah, it's wow. un- that's called unity. That's fantastic. <laughs> so... Uh, when I, I want to close out in this, and, and this will be the last thing. Um, when people are reading, because we talked about this in our Tardo episode, but when somebody's reading something, wh- whether it's the Bible, Billy Meyer, whatever, um, what is the best way for them to look at these texts and assimilate it for learning? I, th- I don't think th- th- there's not like a best way, because I think that's unfair for me to say that my way to do it is amazing. But I will give an example of what I do. Mm. I open up a book. I have tabs that I use like sticky tab, like post-it ones I make for books. I have that and I have a red pencil. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read something and the second something strikes me, if there's an emotional connection or experience that happens, something like, oh, that's, that's interesting, I immediately underline it and I tab that part of the book. Now, as I've gone through this entire piece of material, whatever it might be, Bible, nonfiction text, anything, when I go back, I'm going to reread everything I underlined and then I'm going to translate it into a separate book. So now the things that stuck with me, I'm going to write them down. Mm. But it may have stuck with you only at that one moment, but maybe it's not good enough to put in the journal because now you've gone back and reread it a second time. And the experience is different when you've interact with, interacted mm, with like it this. a second yes, time. Yes. So then now, so I do a first refinement actually in the book and then the second refinement before it goes into a journal that I keep for my own assimilation of thoughts and emotions. That's the real juice. And I can then go back to this journal of the really good tangible stuff across many, many different works and then comparatively analyze it against all the new stuff that I'm going to read. And does the new stuff come back and challenge what was in that journal? Just new things have to be added to that journal. That's how I do it. I think it's, I personally find that it works really well for me and it's a fantastic way to objectively look at something, understand my experience, okay, and record that experience. If you don't record the experience, you forget. Okay, we're not really fantastic at remembering. But if you can put something on paper, create those lists, whatever it might be, to offload that capacity into there and then go back and reference it, this is the reference material of you, your thoughts and your emotions. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yes. Higher Density Living. You can go to higherdensityliving.com. Mm-hmm. Love to do that. 
and make a journal about what we talk about. Exactly. And we'll have a journal eventually. Oh, yeah. We've already talked about that. We've talked about it a million times. <laughs> oh, yeah, we got, we want alien t-shirts. Yeah. And, and we want our own coffee brand with alien. Uh, um, I want a body butter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an HDL body butter. <laughs> okay, we out.